Um, Tom Hertz is our next speaker, and he's a labor economist with USDA's Economic Research Service. He tells me he is the Department of uh, Labor Studies at ERS. He's the guy. Um, his research focuses on hired farm labor markets. He has a PhD in economics from University of Massachusetts Amherst and has taught at American University, the International Something, my credit ran out of ink, and Johns Hopkins University. Um, thank you. I'm going to stand. Uh, I, think, I think I can be heard if I stand here. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, Phil, and uh, Stephanie, and the rest of the crew for putting together this event. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the reminder, Susan, to point out this little tiny type disclosure here which says that this is my thoughts, not my employer's thoughts. And since I work for the government, that's an extremely important uh, proviso. Okay. So what I'll be looking at today, uh, there we go. So the question that I'll be asking is, to what extent would legalization encourage currently unauthorized farm workers to seek work in other industries? And uh, the presumption is, the evidence is, that uh, lack of legal status, lack of legal immigration status is a barrier to occupational mobility for farm workers, and therefore that granting legal status in one form or another uh, ought to uh, accelerate the rate, the natural transition out of farm work into non-farm jobs that pay better, that offer more secure long-term employment and uh, better working conditions. So if that's the case, we might expect uh, a legalization program to reduce the farm labor supply, and to raise wages. This is good news for farm workers, both those who stay behind and those who find better paying jobs in other sectors, but it's a concern to growers, of course. Um, so the context in which this uh, concern is being raised, of course, is the uh, primarily the recent executive actions, the DAPA and DACA programs, which could grant administrative relief from deportation and work permits to perhaps 45% or more of the currently unauthorized farm workers. And these are all national estimates. I'm not, unlike Susan, I'm, I'm looking nationwide, not just California. So there's various estimates, they're all around half, uh, that might be authorized under DAPA DACA. Now, I think you know that that was challenged in court, and I believe the circuit court, the circuit is hearing the uh, appeal of that challenge today, so it's a, a timely topic. Um, there's also, of course, uh, Senate Bill uh, 744, which got through the Senate but stalled in the House, which would affect presumably much larger numbers, authorize and provide a path to citizenship for the bulk of the unauthorized farm uh, labor force. But that bill had, was the grand bargain, which included a revamped guest worker program that Bill referred to, um, which would have uh, been quite a large program, three-year visas, hundreds of thousands of workers, the potential to pretty much supply California's labor needs through that program was raised at a, at a lower cost than the H-2A program, which does not work well in California. So, um, so DAPA DACA is, is kind of the, the issue that I'm most interested in at the moment. It seems to be the most uh, possible policy change. And it's, uh, it's the legalization without the huge influx of temporary non-immigrant farm workers. So I think the group, many growers are concerned about it, but growers also speak of the benefits of legalization, right? I mean, not all their farm workers are going to leave, and the ones who stay will be legal. And that, that benefits both the workers and the, their employers, who it reduces their enforcement risk, and reduces uh, labor turnover, and all kinds of disruptions, in, uh, which can affect harvest and stuff like that. So that's the context we're working in. So, I don't have to remind many people in this room that this is a very familiar debate. Um, uh, in 1986, the, leading up to the IRCA, there was the issue of what legalization would do to the farm labor force was extensively debated. And what I will be doing is using uh, the NAWS data that was created because of the Immigration Reform and Control Act precisely to track this issue. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the data that I'll be using. And some of the history uh, under IRCA, 1.1 million uh, special agricultural workers, hereafter referred to as SAWs, were granted green cards between 88 and 92. And the question of how many stayed in agriculture was extensively debated. There was all kinds of research done, but the question was not really resolved. There was a fair amount of anecdotal evidence suggesting that large numbers of the SAWs left farming promptly as soon as they could. Uh, and then there was research that suggested that maybe the exit rate wasn't that fast, and then there was administrative data, and that, that was based on the early years of the NOLs. Then there was administrative data that didn't have very good coverage, but that shows sort of a medium exit rate. 
And finally, the Commission on Agricultural Workers, which was explicitly charged with answering this question, explicitly punted in their executive summary, saying that, well, the research seems to show we don't quite know exactly what the effect of legalization per se was on the natural process of transition out of agriculture. So that's the point. People don't stay in agriculture forever anyway. So the question is not do they leave, but are they leaving faster because they now have a green card? So that's the question that I'm trying to answer, and it's not easy to do, actually. Um, so the descriptive data, the basic raw data here look as follows. The, the green uh, zone down here, these are, are the saws who were required to have 90 days of documented farm labor experience between uh, 85 and 86 in order to qualify. Uh, on top of that, came out uh, in a light blue, are the laws. So we have the saws, the laws, and the gnaws. Bear with me. Um, that, those are the people who are in agriculture but were authorized under the pre-82 track. So they had to have been here since 82. There was no agricultural experience requirement, but there are some agricultural workers, about 35,000 right there in the first year of the NAWS survey. So this decline is what I'm interested in studying, and I'm trying to figure out if it happened any faster because they now have legal status, unlike this purple group in the middle who are the unauthorized. And they, of course, grew in number, replacing the ERCA legalizees and replacing the declining number of US citizens here. Okay, so that, those are the, the basic data. And it's sort of clear uh, evidence on the face of it that there's been a rapid decline uh, following legalization. But the question is how much of that is due to legalization and how much is just what we would have, ex have expected if you identify a cohort of people and then track them over time. Eventually they're all going to leave agriculture, or most of them. So how much of that is natural attrition and how much of that is legalization? And so what you need in principle is a control group, a group of workers who are similar in some sense, but who are not legalized. And then you can follow them over time and see what, uh, what became of them. So that, I mean, if you, the, the natural candidate for a control group is people who were here in the, in the 80s were potentially legalizable, but didn't legalize themselves. They were here, they could have applied to be saws. They could very easily apply to be saws without ever having worked in agriculture. There were many, many fraudulent applications for the saws program. We know that you didn't really have to be a farm worker to become a saw. So um, my control group is basically the people who were here in time to have applied, but didn't apply, and then continued to work in farming. And I and at what rate did they decline? That's sort of my control group compared to people who legalized. And at what rate did they decline? And I do it by birth cohorts to make sure that I'm comparing people of similar age levels uh, and hopefully of similar experience levels. But the problem here is that the control group, the unauthorized, the still unauthorized workers, they were also affected by the treatment. In particular. If the treatment is causing one group of workers to exit agriculture, they're freeing up jobs for other people. So the unauthorized are presumably going to stay in agriculture a little bit more because there's more jobs for them to fill as the legalized people leave. So you have a problem that your control group is being treated as well, and that sort of exaggerates the difference between them. So I scratched my head about this for a month or so, and finally decided that the best I could do would be to pull them all together and call that the control group. So if you'll uh, you can follow this, what I do is I combine the saws and the laws, and I compare their unemployment trends to those of the still unauthorized workers from similar birth cohorts and with a similar year of entry criteria. Okay, they had to have been here by 1988. Now technically, they had to have been here by 1986, right? Because you had to have worked in 85 or 86 to qualify to be a saw. But we throw that requirement out because, in fact, it wasn't a very binding requirement. But you did have to be here in time to apply, which ended in 1988. <laughs> so everybody who was here by 88 or earlier, you're either legalized or you didn't legalize. I group those people together and call that the control group. And what I'm basically arguing is that this, this combined group has a natural attrition rate for each birth cohort. And what happened was some of the group got out of agricultural faster, and some of them got out of, ag out of agriculture slower because they were taking the jobs of the people who left faster. Okay, that's my identification strategy, and it's a, it's a relatively strong assumption in the sense that you need to have a relatively strong stomach to, uh, to tolerate it, but that's, um, that's the best I could do. All right, so I'm gonna zip through these facts and show you the graph which uh, illustrates the facts, and these are my results, okay? so. Um, 
basically, at the start in 1989, there were 272,000 FTEs. That's the starting line right here. Five years later, there were 146,000. That's this point right here, which represents about a 46 or 7 percent decline after five years. That's this uh, yellow, this green line coming down. That's the observed number of saws and laws nationwide uh, who were still working on farms. Um, but by doing this comparison to a control group cohort by cohort analysis, I uh, determined that about 26% of that was normal attrition, and about 21% of it was the effect of legalization. So this purple band here is my estimate of the effect of legalization. So it's a significant effect, but it's not the bulk of the reason why people are exiting farm work. People are exiting farm work because people exit farm work. But that was accelerated by legalization, is my conclusion. And it was accelerated in a sort of temporary fashion. Right? It, it, it seems to have sped up the exit, but then slowed it down. So by, after 10 years, the farm labor force was basically unaffected by legalization. The two lines more or less traveled together. So it sort of speeds up the problem, or the, or the process, and, which is a problem from the grower's point of view. But after t about 10 years, you're sort of where you would have been anyway, at least according to results from this analysis. So uh, my uh, conclusions and caveats. Um, if you are willing to apply the, if you're willing to tolerate the identification strategy and to believe the data from the early 1990s can tell us something about what's going to happen under an as yet unspecified legalization program under economic conditions that have yet to be realized, um, you have a rough guide to what might happen under legalization. Okay, so that's that's what I'm going to try and do. And the calculation is very simple. If you say that about half of the current workforce nationwide is unauthorized, and supposing that a half of them are granted legal status, and that 21% of those exit because of the legal status, you've got a half of a half of 21% is 5%. So after five years, I'm suggesting that something like Dapadaka could reduce crop labor supply by about 5%. If you start with an industry uh, in California that's closer to 100% unauthorized, then that might be 10%. Okay, so it depends on uh, it depends on the uh, the crop and the shares that are unauthorized. I suppose it also might depend on what share is eligible for DACA. DACA. There might be particular crops which have more people who have children who are U.S. citizens, which is the primary mechanism. Right, DAPA is the one that matters here. If you have a child who's a U.S. citizen, that's the main mechanism by which this impacts farm workers. Um, so it could, it could be higher than 5% uh, in, in some areas and in some crops. And the really key caveat is that the actual outcomes are going to depend very strongly on the strength of the non-farm economy in the years ahead. So I hope I'm on time. And uh, there's my email if you have any questions, or I'll be happy to talk, take questions after, afterwards. Yeah.